But like entering and, and going down the road and learning how to get places, did you have to lean on him quite a bit for that? Yeah, he helped me a lot, but also I have a really good girlfriend that's smart, and she helped me a lot I, with my I was rodeo say, and <laughs> You better throw that in there. Because all the much as I love this boy, and I love this boy dearly, it, without her doing all the internet and stuff, he can be just a tick lazy on that part of it, okay? <laughs> well, I'm just worried about Rope, so that's good. She take care of all the other stuff. Live from the NFR. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, catch up on all the old episodes, and check out the latest. You're going to like it. Welcome to the Luke Branquino Show here in the convention center in Las Vegas, Nevada at the National Finals Rodeo. If you could hear my voice, I'm going to talk really loud right now. So if you could hear my voice, come on by the Cowboy Channel stage and check out the show. I got some great guests today on the show. I have got John Dausch, three-time NFR qualifier, first round winner of the National Finals Rodeo this year, and eight-time world champion, 22-time NFR qualifier, and Hall of Famer, Joe Beaver. Guys, thanks for joining me. Yeah, good to be here. A little bit early, but we're going to do it just for you, Luke, because we love you so much. <laughs> well, a little early. We have to get guys like you especially have to get here early because when you walk through the entrance of this building, it takes you a half hour, 45 minutes to get here just because of the, fan, the star power you have. I think a lot of that's due, though, to the, the Cowboy Channel and the coverage, you know, and back in the day when they didn't have that much, we went on what we saw at the rodeo by just the people. But you get here, and they're true rodeo fans, and they've been here before, and they, they know rodeo, and it's nice to be, you know, appreciated for what we've done, you and I. Ours are, ours are in our back, you know, back porch. We're through, but for the young guys like John coming up, it's going to really help, you know, with the fan power to get behind and know who they're, they're cheering for. Well, and John, even when we were sitting out here out in front before the show started, I mean, people walking up to you and, and taking pictures and, and Bailey said, you know, did, so we talked about it and it's like, sometimes you just, you, you don't want to be around people, but these are the people that the reason we are able to do what we're able to do is because of the fans, the people that come and support us. I mean, that's got to be a good feeling when you're walking through and be like, Hey, John, you mind if we get a picture, shake a hand or, you know, anything like that? Yeah, that feels good, you know, and, you know, walking here and, get to take pictures with all these people and fans and stuff. It means a lot to – at least they want to take a picture with me, so that means <laughs> – hey, I guarantee you uh, – let's see, how old are you now? 20, uh, Ten years ago, if I'd have told you you were walking through here and people want to take a picture and stop and talk to you, you might not have believed me. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that brings up one of the reasons I brought you guys on here. Ten years ago, Joe, and we talked about this, there's always a connection with – kids that come to your clinics and, and people that want to be the greatest. Uh, you guys had a connection, and you've been mentoring John for a long time. And, uh, John, it was something that you, you guys just got drawn to each other. Yeah, I actually went to go uh, sell a horse to him, and then after that end up, you know, being there for what, how long now? Since I was probably, what, 13 years 13 old? 13 years old, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and I'll tell you this. I mean, it's like I told, I've told a lot of people this story, but – you know, the first thing that drawed me to John was who John was, who the kid was inside. You don't get a lot of kids that come up to you and sit and talk and just visit, you know, and they didn't, all he asked was roping questions and he wanted to get better and better. But the first draw is who you are, not what you are. And that's what I've been, you know, so lucky to be a part of John's journey, Jen and I, because it's like, it's like you're blessed with him being around. It's not a burden by any means. Well, and I think we've both had people come into our lives that are very, very talented, uh, but like you said, are not the people we want to be around and hang out. And not that they're bad people, it's just not what we expect to see out of ourselves as, as how, what we expected from ourselves. John, you were that guy that Joe wanted to be around and wanted to help. You know, and that means a lot. You know, he could have picked any kid that he wanted to pick, but he decided to pick me and help me out. Well, and it's paid off. I mean, it's obviously you're here, third trip to the NFR, uh, but it was funny when you guys talking. Horsepower, when you get to the Nash Finals, I always had somebody, every run I made is Trav Cattle, and, and not a lot of people are judge me for that. I know him. <laughs> I'll judge you, because every year if, we, if I was hurt and rebounded from surgery, I'd go to California to try to make the finals, and Trav Cattle is a bulldogger, in case y'all don't know him. 
Every time I would leave the rodeo, went in the cab for open, tied on open, guess who would beat me? Travis Caldwell. So me and him had, we had, we had business. <laughs> but Trav would be somebody I would call every night, even before, like once the draw came out and we knew what they had done, I might call Trav and say, hey, what do I need to do? And, and it was always a start, hit the barrier. You know how to throw them down, but you got to hit the barrier. You guys have that type of relationship. You know, you got that first go around win and, and, you know, it, it really helps to have that somebody to call and talk to. Right. Yeah, I got the first round win, and after that, you know, it didn't go as very good. So I was just roping and should have got on the whole horse I rode last year. <laughs> Decided that last night, but I'm glad I got on them last night. And hopefully I can stay in the average and place in a few more rounds. Well, and Joe, we talked about the old horse, like when I rode Gunner or Willie. Those horses were great outside of the Thomas and Mac, but when they got here, it's like they knew where they were at. They knew it was time to perform, and that's what it sounded like happened last night. That horse just swelled. He was like, okay, I'm here for the big show. Well, and he knows when John's on him, it's a real deal, you know. I mean, uh, his little brother Kobe is one uh, high school uh, state on him, one, you know, Texas on him, one they're open out here on him one year. I mean, he's just that kind. Last year, we just kind of stumbled on to him. Things weren't working. I said, man, John, try dumpling, you know. And he went, I think, 70000 or something, you know, at the end. And and But here's the deal. You know, you got to at one point, you know, I, John's got to make his own decisions. Right. You know, he's got to rope for himself. He's got to think his own way in and out. And, and trust me, it was hard after about the fourth, fifth round. I wanted to hit him with my microphone <laughs> when he rode in the box, you know. And and he's like, hey, you know, come. But, but, but John has got to make his own decisions. And John is one of these guys that – Every day you roped and every day we practiced, if, if he ran 10, if everybody else ran 10, John ran 20. So I wasn't going to step in there and say, hey, man, listen, get off, get on. I wanted to for the because the money, you know, I want him to win. But for later in his career, I want him to also know that I, I'm in his corner, but I'm not his corner. I'm not right. going to be the guy, you know, that steps up there and takes. It's like I tell everybody, they say, oh, man, look what you did with John Dowd. No, 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 no. Look what John Dowd did yes. with, with me. Yes. Not what I did with him. He did it with me. And and he made his own decision last night. And, you know, he got through and he came back in there in the box, kicked the box down for Corey Solomon. I'm looking at the TV, my monitor, you know, my microphone. I kind of glance over at him. He looks over at me and he goes, and I, and then we did. I just took my microphone. Like I was going to hit him too, you know. But we knew that didn't mean nothing. We're just, I'm just glad that he made his decision. He, and either good or bad, rest of the week, whatever right. it is, I'm going to back him in his decisions because – very, very few guys have I been around as long as I've been around John that that I can honestly say we've never had a cross day. Yeah, and you know, you know me, Luke. I'm easy to cross with, you know. But so for him to do that on his own last night and it rebounded, made a great run. Two rounds left, average, still a lot of money out there. That's what makes me proud of John Douch. Well, and that's what I've always loved about you and growing up watching you and then getting to travel with that travel. I, we did, though. We yeah, had fun. Like we my had last fun. couple of years, you know, you yeah. got to go a lot together we, because we, we flew. Right. And a lot of people that won't fly, you know, they just wouldn't. And Luke and I would wind up going to a lot of the same rodeos, rent cars and flying. And, and it was fun for me because you were young coming up too then, as John is now. Yeah, and getting to learn a lot from you. But that's, that's what I was getting at is you never took credit for somebody else's success. And there's guys out there that dang sure do. You, you'll help, and that's how I feel like Like with Bridger Anderson. He came to my house. His mom wanted him to come, and we got him there and helped him. Man, that kid has done it on his own. Yeah, we we throw in our advice and, and a, you know, our opinions every now and again, but if he wouldn't have asked, he wouldn't have been where he was at. So they, like you said, they, they have their own corner. We're just there to help them as much as we can, and to have a corner guy like Joe Beaver is pretty cool. Right. Here's the thing, too. This guy here, you know, when he was – 16, 17, you know, I, I took him a lot to places that maybe he wasn't. They didn't think he was ready for, but I did. And, I mean, like, you know, first year he had his card, he missed him by one spot, I think. And, you know, we, we thought we thought we were going to get him there then. But the thing about John is every time I sit, put him in a situation to better himself, he, he stepped up and did it. Rose Lee came. Yes, he did. I mean, whether it was roping or whether I put him in situations like this, you know, sitting down talking to people, you know, whether I took him to town to the, you know, big places we had to go talk or whatever to people, he's, he's adapted and he's just gotten flourished better and better. And I think, you know, that's what I tell him. I look for 10 years of a great career because of all that. Well, and you bring up a great point. Learning how to speak and talk is something that I think the rodeo athlete is getting better at, thanks to the Cowboy Channel and interviews. But like when you first started, and even when I was getting brought up, 
you know, at, at the at a young age, it wasn't something that was really a thing. You know, you get that interview and yes, no, <laughs> horse work great. Yeah. But nowadays, it, you need to know how to speak. You need to know how to uh, articulate your words and everything. And that's I learned a lot of that from you, just hearing your stories on how you became great at it. But I think it's something, John, that Joe has helped you with. And do you feel like that's something that has helped your career? Oh, yeah, of course. You know, you know, being out here in Vegas and, you know, meeting new people and rodeoing all over the world. Yeah, you got to learn how to talk to people. Well, and not only people, you need to learn how to talk to sponsors. Right. You need to know how to communicate with them, and, and on a business level, it's that even that much more important. Yeah, and that helped me a lot. You know, talking to this guy, you know, he knows everybody and know how to talk to people. So me listening to him, getting me to talk to more people and learn how to talk to people and sponsors and stuff. So in the tie-down rope, and it's a little different than the bulldog, and we travel far, four to six deep in a rig. You yeah. guys usually one, maybe two. If you get busy in the summertime, you might throw a few other guys in there. But like entering and, and going down the road and learning how to get places, did you have to lean on him quite a bit for that? Yeah, he helped me a lot, but I also have a really good girlfriend that's smart, and she helped me a lot I, with my road going. And <laughs> you better throw that in there because all the much as I love this boy and I love this boy dearly, it, Without her doing all the internet and stuff, he can be just a tick lazy on that part of it, okay? <laughs> well, I'm just worried about roping, so that's good. She take care of all the other stuff. Well, that is huge, just worrying about roping and being able to not to have to worry about where am I entered, where am I going, when she's like, you go here, here, and here, you nod your head here, you go win first. Right, and you know, she she held me in a rodeo, she booked my plane ticket, she drive all night to when we got to be up at 7 o'clock at another rodeo in the morning, and Another eight hours to another rodeo. So, you know, she helped me a lot. So she's the travel agent chauffeur. Yeah, she does it all. You know, but but <laughs> you, you hit on it, but that is important, man, yeah. to have somebody like that in your corner, you know. And I might get a text from Bailey, and there'll be three rodeos, you know. What do you think? Which one we count? Which one we don't go, you know. Because, and, and John, he, he's, he's, a, he's a little different. He's a creature of habit. Like, if he goes there and he likes a rodeo, if it pays three thousand, I want him to enter it yeah. over when it pays six because he's going to win first or second. You know, you know how you get where you like oh, yeah. some rodeos and some you don't. And I told him from the very get go, I said, you know, just because it adds twenty two thousand, if you don't like that rodeo and you're not going to win, you're already beat before you get there. You're better off going to one that adds ten thousand win first. And I think he's managed that really good because you know last year we had, he had a big win, one Houston. Bang. Made it easy right off the top, right? This year, just a little bit of money won the winner. And then really it didn't start till June at Glade, uh, Weatherford. Yeah. You know, in Gladewater that week. And then bang, from there, I think from August, the week of Dodge City, which is the first week of August to the end of September, John wins 65 or 70,000. You know, that's doing it in the summertime. Oh, yeah. But that's what I always liked about him from when he was just a young kid. He was so tough and so mentally strong that I told Jenna one time, I said, you know, I, I want him to win the buildings, but if this kid doesn't win anything in the winter, he'll make the finals because from June on, you know how tough it is and how, oh, yeah. how mentally strong you have to be to win. And this guy, he's got all that. So, John, I was the same way. I was a creature of habit, too. Um, I, would, I would way rather go to those rodeos where I knew I could win 1,500 over a rodeo where I'd had a chance to win five grand but had never had any luck at it. And that's kind of how I went about my career. I knew when I had success, that's where I was headed. Yeah. And then pretty soon those rodeos even started getting bigger and started paying more. So I already had the confidence knowing I could win there. Right. I mean, that's, that's just smart business. Yeah, and if, if I don't like a rodeo, I ain't going to. It's kind of hard for me to go to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Not to bash any committees or anything, what, what are some of the great rodeos that are out there that you don't have any luck at or don't care to go to? Uh, you know, I usually don't have any luck at Dodge, but this year I turned it around. Dodge City. I had a horrible memory. My first experience <laughs> at Dodge City, they had, we had a storm come in, and they had to turn the lights on for slack at 10 a.m. in the morning. It was so dark there, and they put us undercover because a tornado was coming. And I don't know if you guys know this, but in California, we don't have tornadoes. I was pretty scared. You have earthquakes. The, yeah, the earthquakes are about the same, just turned inside out. So you can say what you want. But you know what's funny about um, – and, and I had trouble with this at first with John because I was a guy that always – I wanted to go to the, the ones that added the most, paid the most, because I felt like it made me rise to the occasion. And, and John would like, I want to count, you know, Weatherford and Gladewater. And, and I'd be like, man, they don't pay but – 
2,800, you know, this one over here, but, but he wins first or second. Right. And when he wins first or second at him, you know, my wife told me one time, she said, leave him alone, let John rope where he's comfortable. And where he's comfortable, he enjoys the rodeo, likes the commit, you know, likes the easy park and whatever it might be, right. he shines at it. And that, that's the part of him, I think, that I saw so young, too. I mean, you know, one of the first, one of the first things we ever really did together, I have, this, I have a junior open down there, Easter and Labor Day every year. And John entered one rope in one year. And Jenna said, she was going through the list. She said, hey, John's only entered in 15 and under tie down. And I said, well, I'll, let me go talk to him. And she said, you, I'm just going to put him down 19 and under. I'm going to put him down in the shootout roping, which is an older deal. And I'm going to put him in the breakaway too because it pays good. And I'm like, okay. So I went and found John. I said, hey, you want to rope him all these ropings? And he said, yeah, I don't have enough horse. I said, hey, I got a horse. I just traded for him this week. I said, let's just see what he does. John won all four ropings. And when he, and by the time he won the second one, I, I was like, hmm, this kid does have what I thought he had. And, and this had all come from talking to me. You, you can sit down in my roping box just like this, and we visited for 20, 30 minutes on the horse, that horse deal. So he wins the 19 and under, and I got a picture somewhere of him with Jen and Weston Hughes and Marcus, and that was a shootout team. You know, they're all here now, right. you know? And he won that. And when that, we left there that day driving home, uh, and I think you were 15. Yeah, you were 15 under. You was 15. I, I told him, I said, you know, if he stays on the right path, this kid will make it. He'll make it with a rope. And it's so reassuring for me to be able to tell somebody, because I do 20 clinics a year, run, you know, 600 kids through, whatever, to tell them, that, yes, you can make it with a rope nowadays. It's enough money in the arena. There's enough money outside the arena with the coverage and all that, you know, Luke, I, I could have told you that when you cracked out in 2000, but I might have been kind of pushing it a little bit. But today's world, you kids out there, if you want to do it and you think you got it, you can make it with the rope. Well, and there's so many great ropings now, like you yep. said. I mean, Mike Johnson has his rope, and yeah, just throughout the whole course of the year, there's so many great ropings for the, the youth that, like you said, yeah, if you're handy enough with that rope, you have a chance to make it. And like you see Riley Webb, and this is, I think, is a great example. He, at a young age, went to those WCRAs. I mean, he had almost 500 grand won early before he even got his permit, just dinging him at all those jackpots and those WCRAs. John, I'm gonna say, but I'm gonna say, Shad Mayfield has won seventy thousand this year, jackpotting. You know, right. and that's just jackpotting, mixing it up. John won one last week, when paid seven thousand. You know, I mean, we only used to have two or three opens a year that you you could win that much at. But it, it's so good right now. The business is good. You know, money's out there, but it takes the young talent like this to keep pushing the next. Right. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, hey, we all had our run, but we were all pushed out by the next bunch. And right now, it's John's bunch pushing on the door. Well, and then you bring that point up of horsepower. We talked about that earlier. It seems like now, even at the high school rodeos, like with my oldest, Cade, some of those horses that these guys are roping, you could probably bring them to this Thomas and Mac Arena, and these are high school kids riding them. I mean, it's just impressive. And, and John, I know your little brother is dominating in, at that level. And is that the type of horsepower you guys are seeing out there too? Oh, definitely. You need a great horse whenever you even roping in the 15 on the 19 on or got your PRCA car. You need a great horse. Here on the Luke Branquino Show, we like to throw a little rodeo trivia around. So we're going to ask the question, and you guys put the answers in the comments. See if you get it right. In the steer wrestling event, what is the horse called that is on the offside to help navigate the steer for the steer wrestler? To hear the answer, you're going to have to stay tuned. Keep watching the show because I will answer it a little bit later. I tell you this, I spent more money on horses for these two boys in high school than I did in me making the national finals the last couple of years. But it, two reasons. Number one, I wanted them to have the best chance they could right. possibly have. And number two, you have to have that. It's a, it's a different horse, but you better have that special one now to make it work. And we've, you know, we've, when we find them, we get them. Somehow we, we make sure they got the chances because they're doing all they can on their end, right? Kobe's home right now taking care of the place for us, you know. He's, he's at home taking doctoring calves, you know, exercising horses, chomping at the bits, waiting to rope. John come down last week. We run two calves. He ran two calves at my house. And I said, that's it. I mean, you can, you can bake a cake or you can burn a cake. Right. And he didn't need to run 20. He needed – those two were – I mean, there was nothing I could do different. I said, that's it. Go eat lunch, bye. Yeah, you know? I run 20 before I got there. No, you run 20 a day. 20 a day for how many days? A lot. A lot. But that day, I mean, seriously, two is all – I mean, and I pick him into pieces. I'm just worse. He hates – 
Kind of love to rope with me, hate to rope with me. Yeah, but yeah, he's a hard coach, but he's a good coach. <laughs> <laughs> well, most hard coaches only want the best for their students. Right. <laughs> you know, when we were practicing out there, we would be getting the pin of steers ready for the finals. Usually we'd have flying use herd. We'd have them for three weeks. Yeah. And we would run them pretty, pretty regular for the first two weeks. And, and not me so much, but I'd run five, six steers a day. But like you said, you could bake it or burn it. And for me, there towards the end, I might only run one steer or I might not run one at all. But that competition, I think you have to get your mindset when you get closer. Okay, we only get one one go a day. Let's make that first run in the practice pin that run. And I think if guys sit there and try to push it too much, you you said it. You're or you're screwing with your mind. Yeah, you are. And you know, like the older you get too, you know, I mean, I broke my thumb one year two week two a week before. You know, I tore my knee up two weeks before. I mean, it's stupid to overdo at some point. But John's still at that. You know, he's still young, he's still strong, he's still athletic, he's still craving it. So he's going to run him. But when we got to that point, I was like, hey, man, you know, you're ready. Go ahead and stop. You know, we, you talk about people you meet and people that come into your lives and stuff too, you know. Um, John and I are lucky. We've had, I, I met him 20 I think 20 years ago at a restaurant here in town, but we were all, we went to eat one night and there was a wait, you had to wait three hours and there was one table came up for four. They were two, we were two. And I looked at him and I introduced myself and I said, you want to eat dinner tonight? And he said, sure. And Jim Pickens has been a big, big blessing for uh, me and John right here. He did a lot of help for us in the, in the rodeo world. But without me knowing people like Pick, introducing to people like John, letting John meet people like Pick that can carry him elsewhere. I think that's what we're missing too a lot in rodeo is, is not that, hey man, look, you can find a lot better help than me, don't get me wrong, but it, at least I know people how to put John in position to meet people because they've got to have, the younger generation's got to have the know-how and the connections that you and I made along the way. Right. And I think it's our job as, as elders, Luke, and champions to pass it on. 100%, and, and I feel the same way. And, you know, you talk about not what you know, but who you know. I think that plays a big role in helping the youth and bringing it up and, and getting more exposure not only to that athlete, but to the sport of rodeo. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're seeing now. It's that Jim has been a huge ambassador to the sport, a team yep. roper, and he, is, he has really helped expand the reach of our sport, which is huge. We need that because we're on the uptick right now with the Yellowstone effect is what they like to call yep. it. You see more cowboy hats uh, walking around than you ever have. And you, you know how it used to be when you go through LAX airport, you'd have a cowboy hat on, you'd look like you had two heads. Okay. Now, hey, are you, you're on Yellowstone, you a cowboy, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. I've been called Rip. I know I'm a little bit better looking than he is, but... Uh, um, but I About mean, the same temperament if you really knew him, so... <laughs> But that's the, that's the wave we need to keep riding for our industry. Yep. And, and, it, and it starts, you know, it starts with the guys that, that have the responsibility or the ability, you know what I mean? Luckily, Jen and I are in a place where we can help, you know? Right. And, I mean, I'll tell you this. As much of, of help as I was to him and, and Kobe, they were to us because they came right. along, you know, and we lost Brody, and there's a void there. I mean, my, I have a void, but my wife had a huge void. And I'll tell you, these two guys right here, I mean, they're like family to us. I mean, you know, like I tell everybody in interviews all the time, I, we're not mom and dad, but, but I, I guarantee you the next person they'd call, or it better be me, but in general, right. because that's how we feel about them. I've had him since, you know, I've been lucky enough to be around since he was 13 years old. I'm not going to quit him in the middle of his battle for right. dang sure, you know. So I think things happen for a reason. I'm not a, I'm a person that always looks, you know, it's, it, it, my old man told me one time, I never will forget. He said, look through your windshield. You see how big it is? And I said, yeah. He said, look at the rear of your mirror. See how small? You can never change anything that has already happened, and you can't fix anything behind you. But there's a big, bright future ahead if you look the right direction. And that's how I think we were so blessed and so lucky to have John Kobe come into our lives that it was my obligation to do all I could to let John reach his potential. Because if, if I would have let this much talent die off because of uh, – Maybe not having the chance, man, I couldn't live with that. Well, and a great point. We talk about doing our clinics and having lessons, giving lessons. You know, I've had kids come through there that you give lessons to and you charge them because you could tell, okay, maybe this kid wants it but doesn't, you don't really know. And then you have guys like John or I had like Tucker Allen. You know, that kid, he came up, he worked his butt off wanting to be the best. And those are guys you just bring in and there's, it's no charge. If I have a horse, ride it for free. You know, things like that. And, 
for me, that is us giving back to the competitors that we once were. Yeah, John gets a free roll on Jenna. I won't charge him all the time, but she won't charge him for nothing. First thing she told me this morning on the phone, she talked to me. See, don't blame him, we're going to do good. And you just keep smiling because you're not getting none of the money. <laughs> well, that's got to be a good feeling, John. Jenna on your side like that, huh? Oh, yeah, that's why I always call her. <laughs> hey, hey, Jenna? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, every time I'm in the bond, I always call Jenna first. <laughs> well, and we talk about how things have changed. Joe, you know, when we were started, and I'm not—I'm going to pull this card out. They're a lot bigger, stronger. We had a lot tougher competition. You know, you hear that from old competitors, old champions. That's not the case. Yeah, things have changed, but the talent—I feel like the talent is getting even deeper. You know, and when we were going, it was a battle. You'd have a battle between two or three guys. Now these guys are battling between ten. You know, and, and times have changed. Calves have changed. Horses have changed. Yeah. Uh, but, but I'm going to tell you what else I think too is a lot different is. You, if I go through there and I go down to 20 maybe, there's about, what, eight of y'all that have roped together forever, right. you know, and all the junior events, you know, I, I say all the time, I think junior high rodeo is maybe the best thing ever happened for high school rodeo. That helped college rodeo, that helped the amateur level, that helped the pro level because you you learn that you have to do more than just one day. It's a it's a series. It's a points chase. You know, I remember when we were going to high school rodeos. There was a couple uh, region rodeos that had really good ropings at the same time. And I'd ask John, okay, John, you want to go to the qualifier and the region rodeo, or do you want to go to this rope that pays you know thirty five hundred that day? Because it, it, you, if you miss one or two weeks, you're in a bind. But I think it's taught these young guys, Riley Webb, Shad Mayfield, um, Kincaid Henry, Macon Murphy, all these guys, you've wrote with them, John, since y'all were 12, haven't you? Yeah. And, and it makes it, I think it builds those guys to know that they, it's such a competition now, yeah. like you said, of more, more than just two or three, that you have to win continuously. You know, I remember back in the day, you know, we were we guy win Houston, win San Antonio, or win Cheyenne. He's pretty much in. You know, you figure out uh, he's yeah. gonna win enough. Yep. Now you better win Houston. You better win more, or you won't make it anyway. So I think that's a hats off to how good the money has gotten. But I think it's also like you said. I think it's a different. It's a different group of young guys. We we had our group, and we weren't too worried about the young guys coming in. You know, there was Cody O. That was a different story, young guy. Right. You know, there was Brent Lewis. That was a different story, young guy. You know, those guys. But we weren't worried about 10 of them. And right. I think now there's 10 of them with your – don't you, John, with your group? Yeah. And that was like this summer. I had 105,000. I called Joe and I asked him, do you think I was going to be in? He's like, no, you better win another 10,000 so I have to get the win. And, and you were right. <laughs> and, and really when I said that, I was just buffing, I thought, yeah, you know. Right, yeah. I just said, man, you know, we don't want to rope first. and win another 10. He wins another 10 and he comes in 13th. Right. You know what I mean? When you got to have $100,000 win to make the national finals, I'm going to tell you something, people. You can go to Howard Me Rodeo as you want to. It's hard to win $150,000 when you're banging heads every day. And there was, what, three of them had more than that when we come in? So, yeah, it's uh, yeah, John, he he's the one thing I can say about this kid is he if I if if I have an opinion and he he asks for it at all, if if I tell him to run through that wall because I think you're going to help yourself and be better, you know that wall's in trouble because right. he's got what it takes to survive and to win continuously all year. Like I said, last year was a breeze, one Houston. Man, I thought, hey, we got this. We can just cruise, you know. This year, not. And he made them both ways. And that's what makes me so proud of him. Uh, I'm proud of the person he is first. But his roping, that's what makes me so proud of his roping. Because that spark I saw, you know, 10, 12 years ago, whatever, it's still there. Well, when you're talking about that spark 10 or 12 years ago, and I've always tried to preach to the kids that come to me. I said, you're, and they were getting ready for high school rodeo the week, you know, we're practicing on Monday, high school rodeos that weekend. They're like, well, we got to get ready for the rodeo this weekend. I said, no, that should have been done a year ago. Right. You need to get ready for the next step of your life. When you're practicing, that's just a stepping stone to what you're getting ready for. And I feel like, especially now, maybe not so much 10, 15 years ago, they were just practicing for that weekend. They are not practicing for the future, and John, at a young age, felt like sounds like he was practicing for the future to be here to be a competitor. Yeah, and, and I don't like to practice just for one rodeo. I like to practice for all the rodeos. Well, and mentally, physically, and everything, yeah. you have to practice that yes. way. Hey, they have a little, uh, they have a little jackpot down there on Tuesday or Wednesday. Wednesday nights, two for one hundred and fifty, just a little, you know, whatever. You know, 
you go watch on one of those Wednesday nights, and there's five or six guys in the top 15 there. You know, you think they're there for their health? They're right. there to tune up. Right. They're there to stay sharp. John takes a practice horse that we've had for I don't know how many years, you know, and he went 1500 a week or whatever, 500 a week. But it's not about that. It's about staying sharp and working for, like he said, wherever he's entered at, not just that week. And that's that difference, you know. You know the reason I think, Luke, they take 15 people to the national finals? What's that? Because there's not 20 with the, with the grit and the right. grind in them that can do it. You know, you for could sure. open up to 30, and, and you're still going to have 15 elite. And for John to be part of that 15 elite three years in a row, right. man, that makes me proud for him. But what I like you said he, is he did it both ways. Yes. One big in the winter. And for a lot of folks that don't understand or know how the, the standings works, Houston used to be able to win 50 grand in Houston, and you just sit back and maybe go circuit rodeo. Now it's not that way. You went ahead and won Houston and dominated throughout the year, and then this year, man, it was a, it, not a struggle, but it wasn't an easy path, yeah. and you were able to do that, overcome it, and, again, make the national Right. Finals. I didn't really win as much as I wanted to in the winter time, and this summer, you know, it was a really a test. It made me try a little bit more. Joe, what, uh, what were some of your favorite? We talked about John's rodeos he didn't like, but what were some of your favorite rodeos that uh, – you got to compete at a young age. Man, I never would. I, Ellensburg was my favorite yes, always because, you know, I knew I, it paid good. It was a big arena, big crowd, you know, and I knew in, in a week or so uh, next week I was going home. So right, I was yeah. wanting to win as much as I wanted to. And back, you know, way back there when the year was over at, and in October, the last rodeo of the year was San Francisco. Oh, yeah. And that was my favorite. The slack was at 12.01 midnight. It was after because the, they had horse show events and rodeo events and it lasted till like 10.30. So then they take a break, and then the slack started twelve oh one, and there was around the in, the in, around the outside the arena inside the the old coliseum there, there was uh, there was a little, a little two little bars around there and stuff. So you know we'd hang out in the bars, and the people that were trying to get in the top fifteen, boy, they were fun to watch. They were they were <laughs> they were drinking heavily, and they were nervous. The ones comfortably in the top fifteen, they were drinking and having a good time. So. <laughs> It was kind of fun for us to see who could make it and who couldn't right there at the end. And I've been in that position. Hey, I, I, I had a couple of surgeries, you know, years and had to fight back. And, you know, one year, one year starting October the 1st, I competed at 27 rodeos that month. You know, it was playing trains and automobiles. But it's, it's because you want to be that elite top 15, you know. But Ellensburg, you know, the Cow Palace was always great. And I always liked San Antonio. Because I can remember as a little boy, my dad take me and let me watch the slack. And there would be 200 guys who were open to slack. And I remember walking out of the building one day. He said, well, did you, have, did you enjoy that slack today? And I said, I'll enjoy it when I'm roping there. And, you know, to get to do it, you know, 15 years later was pretty important. Well, what I don't think what a lot of folks don't understand is when you're talking about San Francisco, the last, that was the last rodeo that of the season. It. That was it. You can go, and if you, if you dinged them, what, win 6,500? Maybe 4,500 4, yeah. mm-hmm. and that was when everybody was there. Everybody. I mean, you had a hundred plus tie down ropes. Yeah. And if you like John, like we was talking about, if you had 105,000 and you thought you were in, you still went because you didn't want somebody, two guys to win 4,500 and bump you out. Right. Well, now they get a little bit, a uh, little bit better payday at their last rodeo. And granted it doesn't take as many guys, but Sioux Falls, the governor's cup, that sent shootout. I mean, that's a four, potential $45,000 payday for somebody. And we've seen how that shuffled the standings tremendously. I mean, in the team rope of Marcus Terry yep. and his partner, Cole Curry, they were in the top 15 going in. The first round got over. They're out of the top 15. Hmm. You know, that that's one thing it does. It goes Clint the Summers ball. and Jake actually made it right there, really. And they've won 125000 here. So, you know, right. whatever they won there, you add that or he, they wouldn't be here. It makes it – actually, I, I'll tell you, John, we talked about John didn't have no luck there. And he had one, two, one, two rodeos left, and Bailey had him entered. And he said, what do you think? You think I'm good? Or I, should, I said, you drive right on over there, <laughs> and I don't care if you catch or miss, but we're not going to let him get us by one rodeo. You know, that's how important Sioux Falls is. Yeah. Was that Utah? Was it uh... – uh, No, I actually drove to Bowie, Texas. Bowie, Texas. Yeah. Hey, I'm telling you, it, it, we're not going to let them beat They may beat us, but they're not going to beat us because we don't try harder. Well, and, and it, again, we talk about how much rodeo has grown and, and the money obviously taking more than 105000 right. when you called Joe. And uh, it, it's just impressive to me that these Cowboys, 
I honestly, Joe, I think about now it when my the last year I went it took seventy thousand to make the finals. If I was healthy and wanting to go again, it seems like a little more stress to try to win another twenty five grand when that was kind of where I felt like I maxed out. Yeah, but I don't think that's a, the case because rodeos, that I, did John tell me I'm going to, and I'm just picking one I'm thinking of because I had to fly in there one time on a crop duster. to. He said, Elko, Nevada. And I'm like, why would you go to Elko? It doesn't add fifteen, two thousand dollars $2,000. It adds $10,000 now. You know what I mean? So the rodeos have stepped up so much. I mean, uh, look at Preston, Idaho, 15 or 10 or whatever. You used right. to add 2,500 when I went. So I think the money's easy to get, but I think what's the difference is too, we have so much more coverage now yeah, and so many more, you know, I remember when they first opened this out here, it wasn't near this big and there wasn't near this many people shopping and stuff. Now, you know, I think the opportunities are there. I think the hard part for the guys now might be that if you make mistakes, you pay for it because somebody's going to win 5000 one week at one one-header, and all of a sudden they've passed us, passed them where Luke used to. They'd have to get them at two two-headers right. to beat us. Yeah, for sure. And that's something we have seen kind of go away more so, too, the two-headers. A mm-hmm. lot more one-headers. John, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, as, I, as a competitor, I love the two-headers because I could have one that wasn't real good, maybe place on him and then come back with a good one, have a chance to win the round on average. Uh, what are your thoughts? Do you like two headers or one yeah, headers better? It really just depends where we go. Like when we go to Northwest, I like roping the two headers. We rope, you know, you know those core inning calves. I'm used to roping them at home, and you know, you get one decent when you get by, and then you get one that's not very good, you know, and try to win some money on it just to stay in the average, and then you come back in the I don't know top five or six and place in the average. Well, I mean, I guess as a guy that's out there winning, it doesn't matter whether it's one header or two headers. The one thing about one headers feels like maybe you get to go get to go to more rodeos. Right, and then the, the two headers, you know, you get a chance for three money, you know, the first round, second round, and the average. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Joe, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, we've seen some good two headers go away. You know, I like a big one header, and I'll tell you why. You can win sixth or seventh, and, and, and I'm, I'm not talking about the two headers like Ellensburg, now, now Kennewick, Walla Walla, those are San Antonio. Right. I think if you're big enough and you add enough where your go-arounds pay – Really good, great, more power to you. But what I like to see now, the little two hitters we used to have to go to, back and forth and pay for trades, and you know you, you can win around and lose money. Yeah, I, I like the big one, the one hitters for those types of rodeos now because some rodeos John goes to now, like I can't remember whether for forty five hundred or something, it used to be a two hitter rounds paid two thousand. You had to win around the average to win when he won one run and he was out of there. So I, I'm big on. And it's just like the, the, the tournament system. You know, they do some of those. And, and s- some rodeos have the money to make it great. Some of them are just adding more runs and make you go back and forth for, you know, not a lot of money. I'm not a fan of those. Running the wheels off your yeah, horse. Yeah, you make extra rig, runs yeah. on you and your horse. Actually, we crippled one this summer on about the third time he had to go back and needed him one more, two more times. And, you know, we had to scramble around, and that's when we got the grave. I mean, we were in a bind because – he should have been, it was already done. He run two. He should have been in the short round or not, you know? Well, real quick, I have to say, if you guys are watching and enjoying this show, please check out the Luke Branquino <laughs> show on YouTube and like and subscribe. I say this every time. If you subscribe, it has a chance to help me make money, and I'm a retired steer wrestler. That- hey, listen, <laughs> one thing about it, he will sell himself. So if you just want to buy a piece of him, you can buy a piece of him yeah. too. <laughs> That's it. That's he, He's right. But like and subscribe on YouTube. Check it out. I have some great episodes. Joe was actually a guest on. We had two episodes because we talked for a while. You sitting in the truck, and it was hot that day, wasn't it? It was hot that day. I had air on it, but I was staying hooked with you. I didn't quit. <laughs> well, let's talk one thing before we get off the air. Um, replay. I mean, we've seen some calls this year at the National Finals Rodeo, and, and we talk about wanting to be a professional sport. Well, we need to step up to the plate. Listen, nothing in the world is harder than flagging in the heat of the moment. Agreed. I'll say that. Or, or judging a mark out. Or, no, that, that's, that's the hardest thing in the world. But it takes about that long for a replay. And we actually had it at the scent shootout when they had the scent shootout over at the Orleans a few that's years right. back. Yeah. We had it over there. It was for the 16 through 25 people that got invited. I'm a, I've been a cinch for years, I, so I'd get an invite to rope. My partner and I, McCoy, were 4-1. They flagged me out for crossfire. I turned my rope. I challenged it. You know, challenged it. I went to the back end to get my rope. 
the judge rode to the booth uh, or the the let a deal with the uh, screen, yep. screen right there by the chute. Watched it. By the time I got my rope at the back end and rode out the gate, he had already watched it, knew it was a mistake, reversed the deal. We won second, and it did not hold up anything. So if we can we can have it over there for five thousand, there's no excuse that we can't have it for thirty thousand over here. We're not running over the judge's call. We're not saying they're not flagging right, but if you got a call and it's worth five hundred for you to take a chance, you ought to be able to somebody watch it. Oh, a hundred percent. And you know, if it's about production, I call BS on that because I guarantee you those fans in the stands and on TV, they want to see the right call and the right person win. So if they're worried about in upsetting any of the fans, that, that's BS on my in, in my opinion. So I think maybe we'll get to see something in the future, John. I mean, you're right at the potential the forefront of a replay at the national finals rodeo. Um, that's got to be huge. Just being able to be in that situation. Hopefully, never be in that situation, yeah, right. but have the opportunity if yeah. something happens in a bad car. He's like, hey, hold on a second, let's have a look at that. Yeah, you you need an instant replay, like like in the team rope another day, and then in the calf rope, and you really need a. Hey, and I'm not saying you can have it everywhere. I'm right. not, I'm not no, saying put it can't. in everywhere. You can't. There's a million rodeos. There's a lot of judges learning at the little rodeos. I'm not saying that. But I think two things need to happen. I think a replay needs to happen, and I think we have got to figure out how. And there's ways. I mean, I think I think there's a lot of ways of money coming in and around. We got to pay our judges more. Agreed. We need good judges. I mean, it's like to me, it's like teachers and policemen. Why in the world they don't make a ton of money? I have no idea because we need those. We need good judges, but we have to be able to let those guys make a living doing it. The top 40 guys, 40 to 40 judges, because they're making calls all year that are very stressful situations. I love the posts on social media when you know we talk about replay and. All the folks say, well, these judges need to be held accountable. They need to get fined for making a bad call. Like, you think that they want to do that? I guarantee you Joe Bob did not want to make that call. That's what he saw, and that's Mm -hmm. what happened. You know, in in the team rope, and Chuck and I I think Harry might be, I'm calling him out. I hope I don't get in trouble for that. (laughs) Yeah, you are. You're just right on top of him in case you're wondering. (laughs) But they don't want, it's not like they woke up in the morning like, hmm, let's screw Coleman Proctor and Logan Medlin today. I'm glad they went fast so we couldn't flag them. That's, no. That's not the case. They want to make the right call, and they want the right call made if they mess up. So I think that's just going to – not only that helps elevate us to a more of a professional sport. Let me ask you this. If, I, if I'm a judge and I got 20,000 watching me an hour many on TV and I make a call and, and it's the, the contestant thinks it's wrong and he challenges it, Am I going to feel better about sticking to my call and making him eat it? Or am I going to feel better about one guy looking at a screen and calling, telling me yay or nay? Exactly. I don't want everybody mad at me either. You know, they need to, yeah, it's, it's the hardest job in the world. Hey, I've lived by the sword and I've died by the sword. Yeah. I've got them up and I've not got them up. You know, so I, I, you challenge them and if it, it comes your way, it does and it doesn't. I thought one of the coolest things of the whole week, though, when we had Tyler after he wanted to go around, Wags wanted to go. Then he got up there at our buckle deal at South Point, Flint and I do, and he said, do we, Flint asked him about it, you know, because it was a controversial call or whatever. And he said, you know, Joe B., you've rodeoed a long time. You get some, and some get taken away. You just keep going. That's the big windshield, small rearview mirror, and that's why he's a multiple world champion. Because deep down, deep down in here, these guys are all made different. They, they don't, they're not the general public out there whining and, and crying about it. They figure out how to rebound. Well, and that's why they're here. And, you know, it's some social media could be awesome, but we never had to deal with it when we were rodeoing, you know. Ooh, I tell John all the time. I tell John, boy, don't post all that stuff. Don't, don't <laughs> let them see you do it. <laughs> Yeah, you guy can get caught up in those comments and all the BS on there, and my wife does the same to me. Like, I'll be reading through there, and I posted a video of Cade jumping steers, and I had over 13 million views. Never thought I'd have one have 100,000 views, but some of the comments on there, I was starting to type and, and I type, you know, punch in the letters or whatever, but uh, my wife's like, don't do it. Don't, don't. Yeah, it's even the worst doing the NFR. You don't want to look on Facebook. Everybody wants to tell you what to do, don't they, John? Everybody's smarter than you. Yeah. 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 Why'd you miss the barrier? Why'd you miss your string? Why? I I couldn't tell. Oh, here's a funny story. (laughs) Brad Gleason was hazing for Jason Miller, and this is many years ago. And uh, Jason gave Brad his room at the. I think it was Hooters at the time. And uh, Jason was struggling. It wasn't anybody else. Just part of the rodeo. You struggle. 
and phone rings like at 10 o'clock in the morning. Brad picks it up, and this guy on the other end goes, man, you need to get rid of that hazer. He's doing a horrible <laughs> job for you. And Brad obviously was hazing for him. This guy's like, um, this isn't Jason. Like Brad's like, no, who are you? Well, I'm a committee man at so-and-so rodeo. So he even had a committee man calling the hotel room telling him he needed to change. I and mean, that's just, anyway, everybody wants to help you out one way or another. The one thing... The one thing I think the national finals brings out, it brings out, and this is a good part, with all the, the shows you have now and with the things you get to go and meal around, it lets you meet the guys. It lets you meet the kids, the young guys like like John. Look at Stetson. You meet him. Yeah. He's, you know, cracks out and he's doing good things. You know, you get to see that they're just people. They're people that worked hard. They're people that tried hard. You know, you don't have to come from – you know, million dollar facility. You don't have to come from the ghetto. You don't have to come from in between. You come from where you are and you do what you do because of who you are. And that's the thing that makes me proud of this boy every day is I know who he is every day and I know where he is. I know why he is. And I think Luke, we look for that more to sell for rodeo than the individual themselves. Oh, hundred percent. One hundred percent. Well, guys, I appreciate you coming on, John. Two more rounds left. You're number four in the average. Staying on the old horse? Oh, definitely. <laughs> but, yeah, no question. No question. Yeah. Well, blast Not the barrier. Not going to comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, go blast the barrier. Catch him around neck. Time down. Best of luck to you, Joe B. We obviously get to hang out so much on the television, and I appreciate all you've done for me and what you've done for the sport. So thank you guys for joining me. Uh, make sure you guys... Like and subscribe to Luke Branquino Show. I'm going to sell it again. Sell it again. Uh, check out all our previous episodes. Like I said, I had some great ones. Joe B., Fred Whitfield, Cody Ole, Stetson Wright, Kai Hamilton. Even though Kai doesn't wear a helmet, we still love him. Uh, check it out. Appreciate you all for watching. Get back here tomorrow, 1030, 1130, for the Luke Branquino Show. Thank you all. Rodeo trivia question. In the steer wrestling event. What is the horse called that is on the offside to help navigate the steer for the steer wrestler? The horse that helps steer the steer in the steer wrestling is called the haze horse.